Okay. Good morning. Um, my name is Bean Gilsdorf, and I am an artist and a writer, and I am the chair of this panel, Reimagining the Contemporary. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our esteemed panelists. Um, panelists, would you please, because we don't have names at the bottom of the, the image boxes, um, would you please wave when I read your name? So Suzanne Anker joins us from New York. She is an artist and theorist working at the intersection of art and the biological sciences. Her practice investigates genetics, climate change, and species extinction. And she works in a variety of mediums from digital sculpture and installation to large-scale photography to plants grown by LED lights. Alexandra Grant is a Los Angeles-based artist who uses language to probe ideas of translation, identity, dislocation, and social responsibility. Grant frequently collaborates with other artists, writers, and philosophers to examine how the languages we speak and the images we see influence the exchange of ideas. Deb Sokolow is a Chicago-based artist and writer whose text-driven diagrammatic drawings and artist books blend fact with fiction and speculate both comically and critically on a variety of topics, including architecture and history, the foibles of heads of state, organizational brainwashing, and the lives of geniuses. Alex Nargis joins us from Richmond, Virginia, where he has been the director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts since 2006. He is also active as a photographer, curator, author, and photo historian, and his photography has been exhibited in the United States and abroad. Susan Silas is a Brooklyn-based visual artist working primarily in video, sculpture, and photography. Through self-portraiture, her work examines the meaning of embodiment, the index in representation, and the evolution of our understanding of the self. Silas is also a regular contributor to the online mag magazine Hyperallergic. Our topic today is the ever-evolving space of how contemporary art reflects and reverberates with the circumstances of the world. New forms of artistic expression develop constantly. Some are a cultural response to the pandemic and others a reaction to environmental conditions. Artists are often avant-garde communicators of society's most pressing issues in their evolution. How do they and art in arts institutions define the new era? Is it post-contemporary? What could it be called? We're going to hear briefly from each panelist and then I have some questions for them. And then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat or use the grab the mic function at the bottom of your screen. Suzanne, let's start with you. Okay, uh, reimagining the contemporary. But before we can reimagine the contemporary, we must first come to grips with what it is. The contemporary is the present day, rife with topics that cause us to pause. They're self-evident, so I don't need to enumerate them here. Perhaps a better way to state the question is what are the effects of the contemporary and how can citizens have a voice in this situation? Um, we've long sought solace from philosophers and theorists, have imagined utopias and science fiction doomsday scenarios, but in the end, what pragmatic measures can be put in place? to uphold our belief and make our work. Uh, in a world where data can be manipulated, both serve justifiable and unjustifiable ends, as we make the world, the world makes us. We are in the midst of a, a, a paradigmatic change, uh, full of effects that are yet to be determined. In the 21st century, nature is not perceived as paradisical, but as a system embracing its place in the great chain of being. While utopia was formally associated and ensconced in a dialogue of social governing ideologies, the concept has uh, migrated into many literary tropes. Philosopher Christian Dunberger discusses historical concepts of utopia, such as the Bible's Genesis, Ovid's Metamorphosis, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, etc. Uh, he explains that social utopias have been supplanted by science fiction allegories as the term utopia came to be viewed as unrealistic. From Aldous Huxley's Brave New World to George Orwell's 1984, 
to Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, the dystopian scenarios ring true. Employing methods generated in my science and society. Atwood describes her work as speculative realism because she cites images and realities already in place, such as genetic manipulation, fertility by design, the collapse of food production systems, and dark, even gruesome social systems, as we are seeing now. Uh, by contrast, Durenberger suggests a new utopian thinking that tells the story of utopia at the small scale of individual life, a utopia on miniature. Here, the responsibility for change and conservation has been placed in the domain of the individual. Let us heed the words of American environmentalist Bill McGibbon. With the climate crisis, he says, returning to normal is not a feasible goal. No one is going to produce a vaccine to tackle climate change. But that doesn't mean no, loss, no possibilities, end of world. Uh, while vaccines are containing the spread of novel emerging viruses, climate change will not be inoculated by molecular means. Concerned um, global efforts to reduce our carbon footprint are necessary to maintain the health of our planet and protect our cultural evolution, whatever that may be because all is in flux. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Alexandra? Good morning. My work explores language and social engagement. For many years, I focused my paintings on a phrase from Sophocles' Antigone, I was born to love, not to hate, which has been a mantra that has uplifted me and given me a framework to process the unburied body of Michael Brown and that of so many other black men and women in this country, the Trump administration's toxic and manipulative rhetoric, the menacing bullies that have targeted me personally on social media, and today Russia's war on Ukraine. Antigone has lasted as a story for millennia because every generation has needed her as a hero standing up to the rule of law of a crooked state with her own sense of a higher power. Sophocles was an avant-garde communicator in his time and still is through the interpretation of artists across disciplines. I've learned to see that love isn't the opposite of hate. It's a choice we make to behave with care towards ourselves, the community around us, and those who are different than us who perhaps we haven't met yet. The opposite, as we are seeing in the world today of love, is war. War's values are not to listen, but to dominate, to choose, as Alfred Nobel said, that justice can be found only in the imagination. Only a profiteer from dynamite and explosives could have such a dim view. Artists and institutions today realize that justice can also be found in reality, that representation matters, that people care and care deeply. We are watching a story of Greek proportion unfold with Vladimir Putin representing an old world order coming into conflict with a new, caring, and brave one. It isn't a coincidence that Vladimir um, Zelensky himself is an artist. He is choosing to model a bravery I would call antigonal, willing to put his own life on the line to choose love, not over hate, but over war and the annihilation of the imagination. So I would call this post-contemporary moment an antigonal moment where the scales tip in the direction of love, hopefully. And I hope this new Antigone, which is Zelensky, but also each one of us who believes in loving those we do know and don't, that she lives on, not because we need to hear her story again and again, but because we as humans are becoming less dualistic. If I could imagine a post-Anthropocene world era, it wouldn't be that humans have become extinct but that the gross inequalities, judgments, and unkindnesses between us have. Thank you. Thank you. 
Alex. Oh, well, thank you. And, and I'm just delighted to be here with everyone else. I mean, these, these creative talents. Um, I'm going to start by just making a statement about contemporary art. All art is contemporary. In fact, all art has always been contemporary. Uh, it's created by human beings, which separates us from the rest of the world. And the notion that contemporary changes is been a constant. Uh, I happen to come not just from an artistic background, but obviously from an art museum perspective. And art museums, um, which are basically an 18th century institution from Europe, um, have evolved greatly in the 40 plus years that I've been a director. And all for the better, I have to say, because museums today are becoming more responsive to the environment. Uh, contemporary isn't shuttled off into a corner to specialty museums. Uh, museums like ours at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts have a huge uh, amount of emphasis on contemporary art. And what it allows us to do is relate to the world around us and be able to be responsive to the contemporary in society. Uh, obviously, today, uh, we have a war in Ukraine, uh, devastating to the people who are, are innocent victims of oppression from Russia. And one of the things that our curatorial ranks, our curatorial, uh, our contemporary and modern department and our chief curator had done, uh, had put together the works that we had by Ukrainian artists. And amazingly, we have, you know, a couple of dozen different Ukrainian artists in the collection from 20th and 21st century art, uh, representing hundreds of works of art. And so we're going to emphasize that and, and pay tribute to those creative minds uh, that many of them are still in Ukraine. Um, and our, obviously our, our thoughts and sympathies and prayers go with them. But, you know, for us in Virginia, one of the things um, that I always rail against is the fact that people refer to Richmond and Virginia as the uh, capital of the Confederacy. And when you look at the fact that in 1619, the first enslaved Africans came to English North America um, and were enslaved for 250 years and then oppressed uh, in the following 150 years until this very moment and beyond, um, we have an obligation to be able to showcase uh, the artistic and creative talents of people whose origin derives from Africa. And so we've done a number of things in response to the changing social environment. Uh, one of those, um, we commissioned Kahindi Wiley to create a 29 foot tall sculpture that he modeled after a Civil War monument uh, of Jeb Stuart. The monument happens to now be gone from Monument Avenue, but it has engendered a huge amount of support and interest around the world. But at the same time, uh, the old social order protests uh, people by the hundreds, if not thousands, have quit the museum as members, have sent nasty and threatening messages. But it is, it, it's indicative of the fact that we are touching a nerve and moving forward. So with contemporary art, we can make a difference. Uh, if you get a chance, there's an exhibition that's just opening in Bentonville uh, that is all about the impact of African-American art and music on the contemporary over the last hundred years. But we as artists, we as institutions need to make sure that we push the agenda forward to make the world we live in better. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Susan. Hi, thank you everyone for being here. Um, so there's a definition of the post-contemporary proposed by philosophers whose thesis is that the post-contemporary is a condition in which time itself has changed. These philosophers suggest that we no longer inhabit linear time. What they seem to be saying is that our assumptions about the future, based on our past, are driving our present. The upshot of this interpretive paradigm is an emphasis on the past and the future at the expense of the present, particularly with respect to human agency. Familiar examples of how this functions are preemptive military strikes, arresting people before they commit a crime, or the algorithms used by Amazon and Netflix to present you with something that you will want, but haven't yet chosen. 
these philosophers are not kind to contemporary art. They see contemporary art as so hopelessly mired in the present that it cannot imagine a radically different future. The post-contemporary reads somewhat differently in the art world anyhow. The concept of nonlinearity has been adopted, for example, to rehabilitate representational painting. And presumably, the notion of an avant-garde has no coherence in a nonlinear world. In the art world, the form content binary is often more compelling and useful than the parallel mind-body binary is to philosophy. The diversity of voices being heard in the art world right now is an extraordinary and positive change. But the age old question remains whether changing the content of an institution in any way changes form, structure, or function, and whether in form and content are separable in the first place. As an artist whose work has been primarily concerned with embodiment for the past two decades, what stands out to me in the philosophical framing of the post-contemporary is the absence of the body. Oh, no. When I am told that I no longer inhabit linear time, I wonder about entropy. The Italian physicist Carlo Rovelli points out that the most physical phenomenon can be run forward and backward to no effect, but entropy is the exception. <clears throat> the human body is subject to entropy and thus to linear time. An underestimation of the importance of the body characterized cybernetics. It undergirds the research into whole brain emulation and external wombs, and it permeates this definition of the post-contemporary. Perhaps it is not a coincidence that most of the work in these fields is dominated by male researchers. What will be the consequence of a theory that diminishes human agency in the present, as if this is not where those preemptive actions originated? How will this demoralized present affect acts of self-care, care of others, care of animals and other forms of wildlife, and care for the planet itself? Perhaps this is a moment to pause in a state of uncertainty a condition that makes most of us deeply uncomfortable as COVID has proven. Maybe if we can tolerate uncertainty, we will allow for greater openness and for possibilities that are not preemptively foreclosed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, how do we reimagine mm -hmm. the contemporary? Uh, Will there be such a thing as post-contemporary period in art? Um, could we be in it right now? Uh, I guess one way to determine this is to ask ourselves, do things feel and look somehow different uh, than they did before the pandemic? Uh, <clears throat> do we as artists feel that something has changed? Um, did something change before the pandemic? Um, I'm an artist. I come to the questions, these questions, um, as someone uh, with a drawing practice that speculates uh, critically on a number of subjects, politics, institutions, world leaders. Um, I also teach art, and I'm the director of our undergraduate program for art theory and practice at Northwestern University. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I was preparing my courses that I would teach for spring 2020, and I know I'm not alone in noticing that my Instagram feed suddenly filled with images of homemade breads and soups and gardening, knitting projects, pages from sketchbooks, and, and a lot of collage. Um, and since sketchbooks are one of the most affordable and available portable vehicles for expression, it seemed obvious that this was a space that people might turn to as an outlet for anxiety and stress. Um, and the sketchbook certainly became a coping mechanism for many of my students, both art and non-art majors. It became a space for documenting life during the pandemic, but also a space that could serve as a distraction from it. Um, and since the pandemic started, I noticed a massive increase in the number of students in other fields at Northwestern, such as engineering and journalism, computer science, biology, et cetera. Uh, declaring the art minor in our department, um, which I think speaks to not just the need for making, but the need for tactile experiences. Um, 
But what the pandemic brings into focus for me is something that I think has been brewing for quite a while, uh, the ever more blurry boundaries between who's an artist, who's not an artist, uh, who makes art, um, why people make art. Uh, do we even call it art? Um, do we call it a daily ritual? Do we call it a mental health maintenance activity? Do we think about it as something that we need to incorporate into our lives to maintain sanity um, with an, an increasingly polarizing political landscape and the landscape of climate change and extreme events such as floods and fires and diseases and, and displacement, uh, migration? Um, a disclaimer here, I do read a lot of pandemic fiction, uh, a lot of apocalyptic fiction as well. So, um, but coming back to the initial question, uh, how do we reimagine the contemporary in art and perhaps uh, the push in prior art eras to find the new, the avant-garde edge art that is made by the artist genius is no longer relevant. Uh, whether we are officially in the post-contemporary period if there ends up being such a thing or whether we are nearing it, perhaps we will have more pressing issues to deal with. Um, while we contend with our changing landscape, it seems like we will need the act of making uh, to be present in our lives in order to cope with whatever life altering events uh, that are coming and those events which are already here. Thank you, thank you. I have so many questions for all of you. Um, I love that this has been uh, kind of um, many different perspectives uh, and and ways of thinking about this this problem of of whether or not we're in a post contemporary moment. Um, and uh, I think I just want to start with I want I want to follow Alex's comment that art art is responsive and thus contemporary, um, and throw out a general question to the group, which is, uh, you know, do you think it takes more bravery uh, to, to respond to the problems and issues that artists are responding to now than it did in the past? Um, you know, all, all of the social and cultural issues that we're facing, um, they, they do seem dystopic, they do seem apocalyptic. And I'm wondering if, if in your experience, it feels like it requires more bravery to respond to these issues than maybe some of the things that even you were responding to 10 years ago? Well, I, th I think that we should go back 20 years ago. Um, I think that what happened during the 60s and 70s, artists responded to the war in Vietnam with forms of uh, body art, performance, video art, land art, etc., to reduce the commodification of artwork and to uh, talk about things in the real world. But what happens in the 1980s is there is a vengeance to come back to the commodity where we are still protracted to this time. And I think unless we look towards the predecessors of the 60s and 70s and deal with the issues of our time, which are not necessarily cynicism and popular culture, but with the real problems of a global network of cultures that we cannot close the door on, as well as the biggest issue here is, um, is the health of the planet or climate change. Does anybody else wanna to, want to pick this up? I've been thinking about similar things just recently, Suzanne, because I just read Martha Rosler's um, Power and Protest essay. And of course, she talks very much about what you just said about uh, art being tied to um, commodity and to, uh, you know, a lot of Reagan policies, Reagan era policies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I think that we could have a whole separate conversation about how the marketplace and and capital 
determine some of the terminology that, that gets used in the way that we we um, sort art into functional categories. Um, and it, it's something I'm really interested in, but I, I don't know if we have enough time to really like get into it this morning. Um, but um, but then I guess my follow up question would be along the lines of what um, Susan was talking about. Does art ameliorate then this um, what did you the demoralized present? Do we do we still have the opportunity for that? Like, you know, the the responses to the Vietnam War were incredibly direct. And, you know, I'm also thinking about ACT UP um, in the era of AIDS and how how direct that was. Um, you know, that to me, having lived through one of those and not the other, um, it does feel like it was a counter to a demoralized present. And I'm wondering if you feel like the responses that are being made now to um, climate change and to um, to other social issues, if they feel like they ameliorate that demoralized present. Well, I think that part of the difficulty, even looking back at the 70s, is that a lot of these um, movements in the art world are very easy to co-opt. I think that institutional critique was very easily absorbed into the institution. So, for example, as a young and I was a TA to Michael Asher, who was a very special and wonderful artist, but his relationship to the institution was very complex because in a way they were able to, to sort of expand elastically enough to kind of almost swallow that critique, not entirely, but somewhat. And so the question, you know, uh, whether, and I think this is true now, whether there's a sort of two-pronged approach in which material culture, the things that we make address these issues, but at the same time, there's another activity that is much more direct activism. You know, I think both of those things are needed. To think that art is going to be solely that form of activism, I think, I don't want to say it's not but I think it, it doesn't reach a big enough audience to be effective. I think that both things are important, you know, cultural and creating that material culture that we're going to live in and a more direct address of what's going on. Alexandra, I know that you have a have, have like different prongs to your practice that feel more or less activist, and I'm wondering how you respond to this. Well, it's interesting that I, going back to the idea of, of um, the market, I think one of the things um, that's interesting to me is when I started teaching, I would talk about entrepreneurship and that was sort of seen as taboo. And now everyone is an entrepreneur, <laughs> you know, and, and I do have that sense. I work a lot with writers and I'm really aware of the fact of, that there, if there was an apocalypse, like I make a thing that I can barter for food and, and writers don't, you know? And so there is this sense, you know, and I promise I won't talk about NFTs, being I promise, but that, that people have more, as artists have more economic control and agency. And to the point of a comment, um, Elisa Meadows has made it in the, in the comment section that, that it's because we have access through social media directly to a public, which may or may not be an art public. And so that possibility, which is market driven, is, is those are the channels in my mind of activism, because we're we're reaching people in 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 a, in a in a sort of retail environment. Let's be honest about what social media is, and and we're using that to message, um, or not we everyone, but um, but many many artists are, and so I think that sense of, of quickness, of accountability that happens on social media and of disrupting. I don't know if the system has yet caught on, you know, to, to the power of social media. I think that's why we are in the moment we're in because nobody, I, I, I remember being in, it's Soma in Mexico City and this young artist said, you know, why from Argentina, why does it, why has the American right understood the meme, but not the left? And I thought that was such a brilliant question. Like how did the meme become the most powerful image text globally? And how does it function and how has it worked to sell us things unconsciously and consciously? So sorry, that didn't quite answer your question, but opened up this question of how these retail channels are controlling our visual exchange culture. And, and, and to the, to the positive, I think, um, immense as equally uh, turbulently as the negative. So 
So, and do, you, do you think the rapidity with which uh, things can be released into the world then through the social media channels creates that positive effect? Is that what you're saying? I, I think that the rapidity um, allows for people to have access to resources that might not have. And it brings into question top-down sort of philanthropy, for example, or top-down institutional decisions. We've seen so many. I don't know a single worker in a museum. I mean, Alex, you're very positive. But everyone I know who works in a nonprofit has had to reimagine their entire structure and their entire uh, view based on the sort of racial and socioeconomic reckonings in the United States and globally. And so these have been very, very tough conversations. And those are happening because of the lightning speed of information being available. I mean, it is also a tactic of bullies, whether they be personal or global. And so we, we you know, it's not all uh, positive. Uh, or easy to surf through, you know, the fake news. Uh, but I do think that, that that when we see the institutional change that's happened, it's because of of these retail, you know, social media channels. And and it doesn't mean that's the only world. I mean, I I, I look at all of us, and please don't don't be insulted to anyone. But most of us began our careers, you know, when there were hall phones and college dorms and things like that. So, um, you know, we are, we, our entire lives aren't on social media. We are bridges between the past and the future. And so we're all learning, but, but I, I really am interested how resources are being created very quickly and distributed question mark as quickly. I'm not sure, but, but that, that we are going to have to imagine this our whole sense of excellence, of academic excellence in, in the arts, of the avant-garde um, in relation to people who are holding much greater resources than we are going to have. Um, and and, I, and I'm and i also a bookmaker, so I know how to, you know, throw money away um, or spend a lot of money in the arts. Um, and so this question is really interesting to me, is how have the resource channels changed and how are those aligned um, with with a new order of looking at, 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 at all the reckonings, the social reckonings? Right, right. Um, I, Alex, I see you and Deb nodding a lot. Do you want to jump in here? Well, I was going to I was going to say that you know, as, as an art historian, looking over the course of time, um, we need not confuse popularity, commercial success, uh, and those kinds of things uh, with contemporary art. As, as an indication of anything but a moment. Uh, you know, I can only tell you that NFTs um, are, are a ruse. Uh, it's an unfortunate. Uh, you, but then I look at even some of the most popular, and I use the word with quotation marks around it, uh, artists in the world from a commercial standpoint. Um, dare I say, and I'm sorry to insult him, but Jeff Koons, you know, uh, he admits to be a fraud. And it doesn't make a difference that his work sells for tens of millions of dollars. That's a marketplace driven kind of thing. I'll turn the clock back uh, uh, 400 and something years. When you look at the work of Vermeer, who was popular in his day, relatively speaking, and then forgotten for centuries. So, you know, in time, all of you who are practicing artists, uh, you know, the the story of, well, they're, they're dead so they can be popular. That's really just a matter of the evolution of time and that those things that are popular and of no consequence fall away and are forgotten. And that has always been the case in the world of art and that really great works of art will stand the test of time. uh, And in many cases, unfortunately, um, will be works by people who today are anonymous and we have no way of knowing who they were. Uh, but we get to enjoy what they created. And so my, my constant um, encouragement is to create, create and be inspired, create to change and advocate for change, because ultimately that's the only thing an artist can walk away from with great satisfaction, because popularity, uh, money, uh, although those are useful, or at least the latter is a useful piece to survive, um, it is not a, a barometer uh, of what art should and can be. Right, right. I think it depends on, I mean, we're, essentially what we're talking about here is the symbolic, right? We're talking about symbolic 
responses to real life issues. Um, and it seems like uh, we don't know what context the symbolic, our symbolic now will exist in in the future and how it will be read by the people who live in the future. So yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Deb, do you wanna, wanna jump in? Sure, um, just a couple of random thoughts, uh, responses to some of the conversation here. Uh, going way back to the question of bravery, um, I don't think we're brave right now because we're all on, you know, there, it, it, none of us are the first to, um, to tackle any of these topics. And um, I think, I think a, certainly a person is brave when they're the first one or the second one or the third one. But I think we're, we're so far into this, whatever this is, that, um, that none of us are particularly brave. Um, or I wouldn't use the word brave. I'd use the word like, okay, it's, it's understood that something is, is happening uh, in the, with the planet <laughs> and how do we deal with it? Um, and um, but uh, to um, to the the conversation about uh, social media and and um, popularity and et cetera, um, it, it really speaks to or when I think about that, I think that that really speaks to the blurring of the boundaries between who is an artist and who is not an artist and and what is art and why do we make it and and so I I I just no longer I, I really see this this trajectory, this future where, um, where these things are, are, are these, these designations, these labels are, are not so important. And, um, and especially with, again, my apocalyptic, um, reading habits, um, you know, sort of thinking about like, well, when the power grid goes down, um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, or when, when we lose, uh, you know, um, I don't know when we, when, when, we, when things, when information is lost, or um, when the circumstances really start to change, um, we're not we're not necessarily going to have a record of this artist, or we're not going to we're going to lose something. We're going to things are the priorities are going to shift, and uh, I don't know if we'll be thinking about Jeff Koons, and um, you know I think we'll just be trying to survive. So um, so yeah, I I think I. Um, I think I the the question of the avant garde or, or this you know that even that expression I don't think will be around um, anymore <laughs> in the, in the future. Perhaps I don't know how you know that's my prediction. Um, anyway, I'll stop. Yeah, I feel like the avant garde already feels like a, a very dated term even even now. Um, Susan, do you have anything to? add to this? I was just thinking when Alex was talking about that interesting contradiction of the way in which our modern life is so different, but there's an aspect to art making that still has that cottage industry feeling to it. That's often an individual person sitting around somewhere making things. And, and that's still an interesting, I think, tension. I also think that artists fared overall fairly well during the pandemic because they're used to spending probably writers too a lot of time alone and just puttering around by themselves and so the shift was not as radical in terms of their day-to-day -day lives as it was for other people and therefore in some ways they were less disrupted i think that's an interesting thing too to see like what people are making because they were able to sort of continue behaviors they're accustomed to as opposed to feeling this monumental breach in day-to-day -day life anyway that's just sort of an aside yeah i i think that depends largely on whether or not they had children who had to you know leave school um when the school yes. closed. And, and of course you know yeah. economic class always mm -hmm. always pays plays a, a role in that kind of thing um so we're we're coming close to our time and i i want to make sure that i'm not ignoring any questions that you might other. well i would like to sort of pick up on the idea of social media that alexandra was talking about and i feel that overly optimistic interpretation even though I, at heart, am not this, I think that it opens up and has opened up these pathways for misinformation 
that uh, really creates unjustifiable ends. Uh, we see this with American politics that is really uh, very scary in this sense. So, you know, when we go to a movie theater or watch something on online, it gives you a rating. Uh, whether it's for children, whether it's pornographic, et cetera. But uh, so media has no controls. Um, and even by changing the name of Facebook, uh, we have a whole different scenario in Spanish speaking culture. So I think, I think that in Spanish speaking cultures, nothing compromised, not, nothing edited out. And, and I think what we, we need to do is um, investigate how we can in some way level the field of information so that uh, truth wins out, whatever that may be. Here's to that. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I love the idea that we're going to have, I mean, I'm, I think we're going to have Antigones for every generation to come, you know, I, I, that's why I, I love that what Alex said too, is that, you know, Antigone is new for every generation and we're going to have to have our, our, our heroes that continue to stand up to the powers. One of, I mean, I, I just, one thing I, I wanted to throw out there was a movement in the museum world, at least, away from funding in the last 10 years, away from tobacco, oil, and opioids in the museum world, to me, has been a really big sign of a shift. And I was, I just wanted to throw that out at the last minute to see, because I do think when we talk about philanthropy shifting, I'm not sure where it's going, but it is changing, you know, from, and, and that big shift, you know, the, um, the idea that the art world is uh, the third largest black market in the world has always intrigued me. And so I think, <laughs> you know, how is it shifting in this new paradigm of an, um, a wild west of social media and, and, and crowd funding and other sources of funding will continue to define the shapes and confidences that people have um, as artists and, and a bit like crooks too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, often as a, as a result of artistic practices of activist artistic yeah. practices, you know, I'm thinking about um, taking taking the name this off the Sackler wing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and things like that. Um, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, it is huge. Yeah, and yeah. and you know, got a lot of traction through social media because mm -hmm. the information was able to get out to a wider group of people much faster than you know, and anything that we've necessarily even seen before. So. Yeah. Here again, there was that bifurcation of Nan Golden as the photographer and Nan Golden as an activist. Mm -hmm. Right. It just didn't come through her work, but it, you know, her work and the seriousness in which it's taken enabled her to put herself in another position mm -hmm. and become the face of the protest against Purdue Pharma. Yeah. And this is the beauty of being an artist, right? You know, we have all of these uh, porous boundaries, I think, between the things that we do. And and also we have these very broad networks that we end up with because everyone around us also has porous boundaries and is shifting between, you know, everybody on this panel has multiple roles as, uh, as an entrepreneur, as an instructor, as a leader of some kind or other, um, you know, within within multiple communities. So... You know, and that means that we're responsible to a lot of people too. So, um, final. Keep, keep creating is what I say. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that they, they want to get off their chest before we run out of time? No? Okay. Well, um, we're really close to our time. Um, and the first thing that I want to do is thank you all for being here. Um, and to say um, that uh, I know that this was very early and I appreciate you very much bringing a, a lively discussion to this, this fine morning. Um, 
But I also want to acknowledge that this is a very intense moment that we're living through. Uh, you know, w watching the news, uh, particularly about the Ukraine, unfold over the last, what is it now, 10, 11 days. Um, and to be thinking about issues of art where they meet power and language and where they meet culture and, um, you know, d a general sense of change, whether that change is good or bad. Um, and I wanted to... Um, to reference a quote by uh, the psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. Uh, and he said, uh, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our freedom and our growth. Um, and I was thinking about this in terms of art because we, we often talk about art as this product. You know, art is the, the material object. It is the thing that's placed in the museum or in the gallery. Um, but I was thinking about art as that as the choice, as the space between stimulus and response. Art is making that choice to respond. Um, and that's a, a really interesting space to me because it's something that is constantly refining itself. Um, and so uh, I just wanna say again, thank you very much. Um, thanks to Heresis for hosting this. Thanks to our audience members for attending um, and we'll wrap it up here. Great. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, it was very nice to meet everybody I hadn't met before. Thank you all. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs>